Greetings, beloveds. This is Amy Karen Johnson, the Earth Channel, here with you today with another weekly message from Gaia, Mother Earth, as well as about astrology. However, today I'm going to take a break, at least starting today, from my series on channels in human design, which is a type of astrology, and if you've seen my other videos, you already know that. If you haven't seen my other videos, it may be completely foreign to you. So I'm not going to go too deep into human design today, but I will touch on it and I will share some links on where you can get charts, whether they be human design charts, Western astrology charts, or Vedic astrology charts. I think I will provide at least those three links to places where you can get free charts from all three of those modalities. The reason I'm taking a break from the series on channels and human design is because last week I put out the 22nd video in that series and I have at least 10 more to go. And I feel like people's interest is waning a little bit on that subject or at least they're tired of it for the time being. I would eventually like to finish it so that all the channels are covered, but there are at least 36 channels. I've seen different counts, and when you look at the different ways that channels can be created with the integration channel in particular, which I covered in September, I think it may even be more than that, even though I didn't do every possible combination there. So if you're curious what I'm talking about, go back and look at some of the videos I did from September. But moving on to our change in topics today, I want to talk a little bit about why and how my take on astrology is different from pretty much everyone else out there that I have seen and give you a little bit of my backstory. For many years, I would say probably two decades at least of my adult life, I'm 47 now, I followed Western astrology. Western astrology is the one that you're probably all most familiar with, excuse me, familiar with. And if you're not very familiar with Western astrology or any astrology very much, then you may only know what is actually your sun sign. And you may actually not even realize that it is your sun sign. You may think of yourself as an Aries, a Taurus, a Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, or Pisces. Those are the 12 signs that most people know and associate as their sign. And in Western astrology, that does come from the position of the sun when you were born. And a lot of times they give you the number of days in each month. And if you were born on one of those days, then that's your sun sign. What they don't usually tell you is that that can change from year to year exactly which days those are. If you know a little bit more about astrology than just that, then you may know of something that they call cusps, where you may have been born right at the edge of one of those times that they tell you means that you're one of those signs. And so you may know that cusps mean that you actually have to look at the year that you were born and where the sun was at that time in order to know for sure which of those two signs you were born in with the sun there. So it's still your sun sign, but it may change based a little bit on, on those that, that edge there and how the sun was moving in that particular year. Western astrology doesn't really focus as much on moon signs and 
ascendant or what is also called rising signs. Now, if you do know a little bit more about astrology, even Western astrology, then you may have gotten into that a little bit more, as well as the sign where every planet was when you were born, because that is a possibility as well. And then you may at least have a little bit of an inkling as to the complexity that is actually true in all kinds of astrology and how those different planets being in those different places affect you, your personality, and your path throughout life. You may have heard of transits, which has to do with where the current planets are in relation to your sun and perhaps all of the planets in your birth chart. They may be transiting over a certain place where you had a planet or sun or moon, or they may be opposed or square, trine, etc. Those are the different angles that are possible in, in particular, Western astrology. Vedic astrology talks a little bit about that too. But they, they tend to, in Vedic astrology, look more at houses. First house, second house, all the way through 12th house, as opposed to aspects and angles. It's not to say they don't look at that at all, but that's where you begin to see a little more of the difference. Now, like I said, rising or ascendant, same thing, whatever they call it, that is typically, well, always, I believe is correct to say, where you will see your first house when I speak about houses. Now, this is getting a little more complex, but I think most of you who have seen my videos before may be a little more advanced than the average person. Then, once you look at houses and ascendant, you may then, even in Western astrology, be starting to think about which house your different planets, when you were born again, are in, in relation to your rising or ascendant sign. The rising or ascendant sign changes the most frequently as compared to all of the other planets, sun and moon. The moon goes through one of those signs or houses, whichever you want to call it, every two and a half days or so changes and varies just a little bit. The sun goes through a sign over the span of a month, but the ascendant changes by hours and sometimes even minutes. I mean, it can, it can change very quickly. So that's why it can become important to know your birth time, not just your day, once you start getting to that level of astrology. If, again, you are most familiar with and most adhering to Western astrology, that means that you are looking at the tropical placements within the signs. You may not have heard that before unless you're pretty advanced. And here is where you begin to see even more of a difference between Western astrology and Vedic astrology. There are a few people who might still call themselves Western astrologers who do not use the tropical placements or calculations, but rather placements and calculations referred to as sidereal. If you've watched my videos before, you may have heard me mention that I use sidereal placements. And Western astrology, whether whichever placements or calculations you use, you are probably also familiar with seeing charts in a circle. Whereas Vedic astrology tends to be in squares as far as the chart. And I'm probably going to mix them up, so I'm not even going to specify, but even within Vedic astrology, there is North Indian and South Indian. One of them shows the houses as diamond shapes or triangular shapes, depending on which house it is. 
And the other one shows them as rectangles going around a board, almost like a Monopoly game board, if you're familiar with that game. So even within Vedic astrology, there are a couple different ways of looking at that. That right there, <laughs> that specific attribute of Vedic astrology is enough to make a lot of Western astrologers not even begin to try learning anything about Vedic astrology. However, that may be why some Western astrologers stick with the circle and just look at the sidereal placements because you may have heard some people who do not resonate with astrology whatsoever, especially popular astrology, which shows you your horoscope for the day, for the week, or maybe the month. And they probably usually talk about your sign. However, the sun moving through the signs, those signs came from constellations. And the constellations have been slowly changing in relationship to where the sun is at each equinox and each solstice. We call it the precession of the equinoxes. And so Western astrology using tropical calculations actually shows no change. No, it does not account for the precession of the equinoxes. So where the sun is at spring, the spring equinox every year, it used to actually be in the constellation of Aries, showing the form of a ram. But currently, come springtime, at least in the northern hemisphere, the same for the fall equinox for the southern hemisphere, or autumnal, autumn equinox, is actually in the sign or constellation of Taurus. And so that is why after much research and studying and so forth, I have decided to use the sidereal calculations. I know that Western astrology has accounted for some of those changes in their description of the signs. And yet I feel it's important to go with where the signs actually are, where those constellations actually are. Because the more you get away from that, the less direct and meaningful it is. Why would you think about how Leo is actually more like Virgo <laughs> instead of actually speaking directly about what Leo is, if that's indeed where the sun was when you were born, for example. Part of the reason I believe that it was easier for me to begin to adhere to the sidereal calculations is because I am one of the few people who was born within the few days where, regardless of where, whether you use the sidereal or the tropical western, calculations, my sun sign remains Virgo. And so I didn't have to make quite so much of an adjustment. But as I began to learn more and more about astrology, I found out that my rising or ascendant sign wasn't actually Gemini, it was Taurus. Like I said, that one changes most quickly. And then even to just go one more step a little more complex to give you an idea of how much I've really looked into this. My moon, according to the first Vedic astrologer that I went to, stayed in Libra, as I had always thought it was originally, even in Western astrology. However, when I began looking at other Vedic astrologers, they used slightly different calculation points. These are called Ayanamshas. Don't, don't worry too much about that, but even within Vedic astrology, there are different calculation points other than just sidereal. So I really looked deeply 
into what differences it made when my moon was in Libra versus Virgo, which is where these other calculations points put my moon, my chart at the time that I was born. And how might I resonate with Virgo as opposed to Libra as the place where my moon was when I was born? Other planets changed too, but I had not gotten so advanced at that time that that really made such a big difference to me yet. I'm not going to get into that today, what I actually found, but suffice it to say that I did come to realize the beauty of my Virgo moon as opposed to Libra moon and why that was still a good thing. Incidentally, I will mention one other thing about Vedic astrology that is also different. They also have moon signs, which are, there are 27 of them. They overlap the 12 other signs of the zodiac, sun signs, or however you want to call those. And it doesn't mean that your sun or your moon aren't still in one of those 12 signs. They are. But there's a deeper level using these 27, what they call nakshatras, as these 27 overlapping signs. And in that case, my moon remained in the same nakshatra. That was part of what helped me begin to resonate with that and realize that it didn't really change anything that was supposed to be part of who I was. And there were other things that resonated even more once I began looking deeper. Incidentally, um, human design, which I haven't really mentioned yet today, because that chart is usually shown in a circle if you're looking at the signs. Otherwise, it might just be the body graph or, you know, showing the centers as superimposed on a body uh, image. If you look back at my other videos, you'll see what I'm talking about. But usually I do show the circle and I use photo editing software to rotate the signs to be in the sidereal placements, whereas there are also in human design 64 gates, which are taken from the I Ching, associated with the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. And there are eight gates that are all located within the diamond heart center at the very center of the body graph very closely tied, at least in my mind, with the heart chakra. However, the human design calls it the G center. And regardless of what you call it, those eight gates in that center that connect to channels, and that's what the previous series has been about, all are placed at the point where the sun is approximately, more or less, it's not an exact calculation, but approximately at the places where you have those equinoxes, solstices, and the midpoint between those four, also known as the pagan holidays, and I have covered this in previous videos. That is why I do not move those gates. I only move the 12 signs using my photo editing software. I know that there are a few people out there. I know that the human design community is not huge to begin with, but there are a few, even within that small community, who have ventured into the idea of sidereal human design, even calling it true sidereal human design. However, not only do they move those 12 signs, they also move those eight and all of the gates so that those eight gates no longer, even very closely at all, correlate with the equinoxes and the solstices or the pagan holidays. They're almost an entire month removed from them at that point. It's, like I said, not an exact thing anyway, but a whole month away is a big difference. Now, before I get to the message from Gaia, Mother Earth, and see what she has to share about this, I just want to mention that I still do 
look a bit at Western astrology because there's one way that they give readings and reports and that kind of thing, astrological, that remains true regardless of the difference in calculations. That way has to do with the angles and aspects that I had mentioned earlier. So when you say that you have one planet opposed to another, one planet square to another, a planet trine, so on and so forth, that remains the same whether you're talking about a birth chart alone or about transits in related to a birth chart and the placements of those planets, sun and moon, at the time of that birth. When you do that, it, it remains the same no matter which calculation points you're using because you're talking about the relative relationships between those things as opposed to the actual sign. What I have found is that I still resonate with those Western astrology reports and readings when that is the focus as opposed to not, I really don't resonate quite so much anymore when they're specifically talking about the signs because I just feel like it's a little off. Now, granted, I do believe that the chart of anyone, whichever calculation you're using, is very complex and shows us how many different sides we really do have within each of us, different aspects. That's part of what drew me to human design because I loved this idea of actually 64 different little points, which is obviously even more than the 27 nakshatras or moon signs that I spoke about. So when you find yourself resonating with your sun sign, if that's what you have discovered first in Western astrology, you may have stumbled upon one of the astrologers who is looking at those aspects and not quite so much the signs. Or you may actually just have another planet who that is in that sign as opposed to your sun. So even though it may be a little different, you still have that aspect to you. What I have found with Vedic astrology and sidereal astrology is that there are even more precise, specific, and accurate because they are looking at the aspects, the angles, the houses, and the actual signs in addition to sun signs. And human design has its own way of looking at that, which I've found to be useful as well and most helpful when I actually combine those things. So I hope this has begun to explain to those of you who may not be quite as advanced in astrology how and why I have chosen to use the methods that I do. I know that some people have been averse to watching my videos because what I talk about is so different and so with that being said, I think that's probably plenty for one video, if not too much perhaps, but I, I do want to get to the message from Mother Earth, Gaia. And I'm hopeful that the messages from her are more unifying, excuse me, unifying rather than divisive and help to show you that common thread, the relationship among all of these different methods, among each and every person, and the similarities, you know, rather than necessarily the differences, even though I also love to speak about our diversity and how we can still come together, even with that diversity. All right, now I'll invite you to take a few deep breaths with me and close your eyes if you'd like and connect with me with Gaia. Mother Earth.
Hello, this is Gaia. Today we would like to speak to you about the concept of investment. Investment captures the concept of putting your attention on something and seeing it grow. When you put your attention on something, you see more and more clearly, the more attention you place on it, what it needs, its parameters, speaking about concepts, speaking about feelings, speaking about thoughts. The more attention you give to those, the more energy you invest into them. And that's not a bad thing. When you invest your energy and attention into something positive, something that uplifts you, good feelings, then you gain and gather more of those good feelings. When you invest that energy into your health, your health will likely improve. Now, as you go, you may notice slight differences in exactly how you are putting that attention and energy into that thing. Or you may notice differences in the exact concept, the nature of it, of whatever you have chosen to place that attention. And you may notice that there are two sides to it, at least, if not more. And so when it grows, those become more obvious. You notice the good and you notice the bad or the shadow, perhaps. Now, the shadow is not necessarily a bad thing. In this world of duality, there is always going to be a shadow, another side, and when we are less familiar with it, it will seem darker. Only until you shine the light of true awareness upon it will you be able to not only see the gift in it, but also to unify those sides. It doesn't mean that they won't remain different. It only means that with awareness, you will begin to see how that diversity can come together. And so we invite you to first and foremost, invest your energy and attention into that which is most likely known to you as change, growth, progression. And it may be a little puzzling to you at first how to do that. But the reason we invite you to do so is because those shifting, changing things, concepts, ideas, are truly the only thing permanent in this world. As you may have heard before, the only thing constant is change. But we want to take that a step further and invite you to contemplate the ways that these abstract things, while you may not necessarily be able to touch them, you can feel them. You can feel the way that they make you feel when you invest your energy into them. And the bigger they get, the more they expand, the more you can truly feel. And so if you find yourself feeling in ways that are uncomfortable to you, that is likely because you haven't found the gift yet, first of all. But it also may be a slight correction point, a point of growth, adjustment, to not only shine awareness on it, but also to 
invites you to place more energy on the positive. So lastly, also pay attention to the difference between something that can reveal a gift if you do place that light of awareness upon it versus something that feels uncomfortable because of fear. The difference is that when you place your attention on something that has the potential for becoming known, becoming understood at least a little better by the light of awareness, you can eventually come to a place of love with it. But if you place your attention upon the fearful ideas of separation, that there is a way for us to, in truth, in reality, be separated from our God source, true, infinite, universal power of love and light, that truth is not true in the eternal, infinite perspective of things. And so it will never serve you. You will never really be able to get to a place of love. And there are many ways that you can come about to that realization. So we don't want to make you feel guilty for any of those possible ways of going about this. Everyone has their own path, their own way of arriving at these truths for which they were born here to discover. Only to point out that there is a way through each of these things where just because you feel uncomfortable with something doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. So contemplate the ways that differences, diversity, and things that are slightly uncomfortable for a time may be just a slightly different way of looking at things, doing things, going about life, and you may benefit from at least acknowledging them as valid. You may benefit from incorporating some of them into your own life, or you may not. That being said, if you can at least acknowledge them, that will allow others their path and their choice as to whether that is the way that they want to go about their lives. And that is the way of love and acceptance and the true only eternal universal infinite reality deep breath let it go always breathe through these things the truth will be revealed. Thank you so much for joining us, beloveds. Namaste.